Happy Friday and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. There is so much to talk about today, but I think we really have to start with this. We want to turn now to an exclusive CBS News and Washington Post investigation. Tonight, our chief election and campaign correspondent Robert Costa and Bob Woodward have uncovered text messages between the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and President Trump's top aide, in which she repeatedly pushed to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Here's CBS's Robert Costa. The stunning text messages detail an extraordinary relationship between Ginny Thomas and then White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, just after then-President Trump started his fight to overturn the 2020 election results. This is a major fraud in our nation. We want the law to be used in a proper manner. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. Oh, my. So joining us to talk about all of this, and I have a long list of the craziest stories of the day, the strangest stories of the day. This is number one. Joining us, uh, my colleague Mona Charon from The Bulwark. Uh, Good morning, Mona. Hey, Charlie. So this is not a secret podcast? No, this one is not a secret podcast. This is th- th- <laughs> this is one where we have to watch what we actually say. For people who are uh, wondering, Mona and I do a secret podcast every week. We tape it on Tuesday. Is it posted on Tuesday? It is in the evening on Tuesday evening for Bulwark Plus members. Yeah, but this is for the whole world. Um, so... Ginny, Ginny Thomas. I mean, look, see, my initial take on this was we kind of knew, you know, Ginny Thomas was a political activist. We've had all the stories documenting it, that she was actually out there on the fringe and that she was, uh, you know, fire breathing, all this stuff. But, you know, I, I hate to say this, but it turns out she's way worse than we thought. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've known her a little bit. I had lunch with her once, full, full disclosure, uh-huh. Uh-huh. um, and, uh, met her at parties a few times. Um, and I knew that she was really super, super right wing. I did not guess that it had gotten this bad, that she had really, I mean, here you have the most obvious uh, assault on our constitution, on our way of life, an attempt to overturn a free and fair election. And she was all in. And including with all that religious talk, you know, God QAnon. is with you. Oh, well, the QAnon stuff too. But yeah, I mean, it is um, it is, it is beyond anything that I suspected and very, very concerning because, um, you know, you, you obviously cannot hold someone uh, responsible. You can't hold Justice Thomas responsible for his wife's no. um, views. But... Uh, the failure to recuse is notable. Now, I realize this it's possible that this tranche of texts was not part of the uh, not. material that no. he in in a Supreme Court ruling that he he dissented on on forcing the Trump people to release to the January sixth committee. So it wasn't as if this was direct. On the other hand, uh, it just seems obvious, a f- uh, flamingly obvious that he should be recusing from anything regarding the January 6th committee because of his wife's deep, deep involvement. Yeah, I mean, it's a screaming conflict of interest. And, you know, we'll double back on this, you know, but spoiler alert, uh, you know, Clarence Thomas is not going to be impeached. This is not going to happen. There are very, very few recourses uh, with a Supreme Court justice. But I mean, the questions are obvious. See, the thing that struck me about this was was is not just that she was so you know active in trying to overturn the election, because I think that's kind of been documented. It's the degree to which she had gone down, you know, the the silos of pure crazy. I mean, I, I in my newsletter this morning, for those of you that, that subscribe, I went through the sort of the nine takeaways. And the first one is she really seriously wanted Sidney Powell, you know, the release the Kraken lawyer. <laughs> She wanted her to be the lead in the face of Trump's legal team. That's number one. And number two, she was sending Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, absolutely crazy, nutty stuff, including QAnon conspiracy theories. You know, watermark ballots in over 12 states have been part of a huge Trump and military white hat. These are the good guys. Sting operation in 12 battleground states. I hope this is true. You know, and Woodward and, and Costa note, you know, at that time, you know, QAnon extremist uh, conspiracy theorists embraced that idea that Trump had watermarked mail-in ballots so he could track the fraud. So watch the water 
was a refrain in QAnon. And here's my favorite, November 5th, wife of a Supreme Court justice, quote, text this to the White House freaking chief of staff, quote, Biden crime family and ballot fraud co-conspirators, elected officials, bureaucrats, social media censorship mongers, fake stream media reporters, etc., are being arrested and detained for ballot fraud right now and over the coming days and will be living in barges off Gitmo to face military tribunals for sedition. And then she adds, I hope this is true. (laughs) <laughs> and this is happening while Donald Trump is saying, I'm putting all my hopes on the Supreme Court. There was all right. of the litigation. Remember that, you know, all the, the congressmen signed on to that crazy Texas lawsuit to get Ben this Paxton. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, Look, uh, you know, Charlie, first of all, let's not forget that Sidney Powell, who is now in serious legal jeopardy uh, because she defamed uh, companies mm-hmm. that you know uh, made voting machines, and so she is battling um, serious defamation uh, suit. Um, but um, but she was too crazy for Tucker Carlson. Okay, I mean he he drew the line at at uh, at Powell, demanding her evidence, which she could not provide, and then and then uh, didn't didn't have her didn't have her on his show after that. Of course, you know. He's had plenty of other terrible offenses. I think so he's the, moved. I think he's moved yeah. his line of crazy since right. he's now all in with you know Marjorie Taylor Greene and everything. But yes, there yeah. was a moment. No, there was, there a, was moment a moment where where Tucker Carlson said, "Okay, I'm willing to embrace the crazy, but Sidney Powell bridge too far. Not going yeah. there for but, at least a moment." But Charlie, the point you made, you know, the watermarks, the Gitmo. This is the kind of like hysterical. And 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 seriously adult bad judgment that goes beyond bad judgment, really. It goes into this person may not be mentally all there. I'm sorry to say that, and I'm not I'm not making a diagnosis, obviously, but just as a lay person, it sounds pretty out there. But here's the thing: a person like that could not maintain a position as a manager of a 7-Eleven. Okay. Yeah. And we have witnessed in the last six I years. I feel that about Trump too. So well, I was, that's where I was going. <laughs> okay, I sorry. mean, we <laughs> have had in the last six years the elevation of so many twisted and crazy and unstable human beings to the highest level of our government that this is one of the things that you know that I keep sort of banging my head against a wall when, um, you know, the people, the sort of responsible anti-anti-Trump types say, well, you just, you didn't like the rudeness. You didn't like the tweet. You didn't like mean the tweets. style. Yeah, yeah, right. The mean tweets. You know, no, there were seriously nutty, unstable human beings. And one of them had his finger on the button. Um, and, uh, and so that's why it was a five alarm fire. And it frankly still is because, we still have a significant percentage of the population that believes this stuff. And we don't know that we are safe from another Trump term. Yeah, I keep thinking of that. Uh, one of the, the worst takes of all time, Ben Shapiro, who was never Trump originally, decided he was going to go in for Trump, uh, all in for Trump in 2020. And his argument was, his self-rationalization was, that he figured all of the damage that <laughs> Trump could do has already been right. done. So, I mean, we've already had the bad stuff. I mean, it, it can't get any worse than this. And of course, now right. we're seeing, you know, what's happening here. And so I, Danielle Pletka. Yeah. She did a piece uh, in, in 2020 about how the, the the left was so crazy that it was driving her, forcing her hand, forcing her to vote for Trump. And, uh, you know, she was, uh, before the wonderful Corey Shockey mm-hmm. uh, took over, she was the, uh, the head of foreign and defense policy at American Enterprise Institute. So the, the rot in the elites is very, very deep. And that is, you know, this isn't just a grassroots phenomenon where there are some crazies, you know, out on the fringes and every party has some people that, you know, you sort of roll your eyes and look the other way. No, they were they were at the very center and they still are, unfortunately. Uh, They still are. So I just want to there's a lot of other things I want to get to. But, you know, I just want to stay with this for a moment because I think there's some misapprehensions about what this is and what it isn't. But I mean, I think one thing is clear is we've never seen anything like this before. It is. It's extraordinary. Uh, Bob Costa, uh, Robert Costa tweeted out last night, 
that Woodward and I both see this as an unprecedented entanglement between a top official in the executive branch and the spouse of a justice. They are privately discussing strategy, lawyers, managing White House staff, and conspiracy theories. Yes. And then I added in my my newsletter, I said, yes, excuse me, uh, they are also discussing overturning a legitimate presidential election in what would amount to a coup. So yes, definitely unprecedented. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> really? Could we just, and also like, and, and I'm, you know, we always have to play this card, you know, what about, I mean, it's pretty easy to imagine the reaction if this had been the wife of one of the liberal judges. I mean, <sighs> if, if Katanji Brown Jackson's husband was texting people in the Biden white house, we ought to lock Ted Cruz up. Do you think that right. it might be a kind of a big story on Fox news? <laughs> you, you think that the yeah. cool kids over at national review might think that's kind of a scandal? No, they would say the, you know, yeah, right. No, they would say that the accusation proves how biased everybody is, right? So you mentioned this, but I do want to, you know, emphasize this. You know, people are focusing on the fact that there was that eight to one ruling against Trump's attempt to stop the National Archives from releasing January 6th data. It does not appear that these text messages would have been included in that case technically because those were government documents. These appear to Mm -hmm. be private communications. But having said that, uh, there are so many other cases and potential cases and uh, various other cases that will come up to the court. And it will be interesting to see what Justice Thomas does. But but people should not be under any illusions here. He is not going to be removed. He is not going to resign. He is not going to be impeached. That's not going to happen. Chief Justice Roberts cannot force him to recuse because Supreme Court justices, pretty much like the president we're discovering, are kind of above the law in many of these respects. Right. Um, so. Right. We, we rely on integrity. And uh, and frankly, you know, the judicial branch of all the branches in the last few years has risen to the occasion and actually shown itself to be to, to have integrity in most instances. And this is uh, a departure and uh, it, we yeah. have to worry about it. We do have to worry about it. OK, so um, strange story number two, um, the, the Mo Brooks story. You and I have not had a chance to discuss this Uh Mo Brooks, who is as as Trumpy and MAGA as you could possibly imagine. I mean, the guy was all in on the coup on January sixth. He yeah, he was he spoke at that rally with Trump and told people, you know, to take names and kick ass. And he's wearing body armor. And for months, he's been saying that Trump would have been reelected if the you know lawful votes had been passed, and that was enough to win him Donald Trump's endorsement uh, for U.S. Senate in Alabama. But um, his campaign was falling apart. And let's be honest about what actually happened here. He was uh, recent polls show that he was third. Donald Trump hates losers. But use as a pretext comments that Mo Brooks had made suggesting that maybe we move on from the election. I don't think that's the real reason why Trump dumped him. But, you know, it was heresy to to suggest that you move on. And so Trump unendorsed him. And then and people know this story. uh, Mo Brooks issued this absolutely amazing statement saying that Trump was telling him to rescind the election, kick Joe Biden out of the presidency and reinstall him now. And he's repeating this. He's out there. He's telling anybody that's asking him, here is Congressman Mo Brooks thrown under the bus by Donald Trump on a local television station in Alabama. Um, The president has asked me to rescind the election. Of and 2020. He, that's, you said that's, that's uncons- illegal. It's, it, you can't do that. What did he ask you and what did you tell him? Well, he, he always brings up, we've got to rescind the election. We've got to take Joe Biden out and put me in now. He still says that. Yes. And I'm going, Mr. President, I'm giving him advice. I'm an attorney. I've read the law. I've read the Constitution. I know it. And I say, Mr. President, you can't do that. It's unconstitutional. And given a choice between Donald Trump who I respect, he had a lot of great policies while he was president, and the United States Constitution. I am always going to choose the Constitution because that's what my oath of office is too. And I knew that when I gave him straight shooting legal advice um, that it would perturb him because it's not what he wanted to hear. And I knew it would put my endorsement at risk, but I thought it was the honorable. Okay, so the honorable thing to do, I want to share. Thoughts? Charlie, (laughs) um, what an invertebrate. What a worm. I'm sorry. This guy is saying now, because he lost Trump's endorsement, now he's telling us these things. Could now. he, if, if, you know, what about during the impeachment 
in in February when it would have been helpful to be told uh, that Trump was indeed <laughs> attempting to overturn the election. What about any time? I mean, what, who, he attended a rally that there was no purpose for on January 6th, that there was no legitimate purpose for a huge rally on January 6th. He knew that. He attended, as you note, in his body armor. He riled up the, the crowd. He actually, in, in, a, in a different world, could even be facing charges of incitement to riot. Um, and, uh, and because he lost Trump's endorsement, he is now trying to present himself as someone pillar. who, oh yeah. my God. Uh, a pillar of constitutional integrity I, that I, I, I just forget. My just conscience? Forget. Yes. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. So, okay. I have two takes on this. Number one is the one that you just offered, which is, Hey, it would have been nice if you would have said this earlier. And it's very convenient that you're remembering this and sharing this with us now when you didn't before. That's number one. But number two, if this is true, if it's true that Donald Trump is continuing to say that he wants people to rescind the election, um, remove Joe Biden and install him now, then uh, it, Mo Brooks is not the only guy he's saying this to, right? So I would. Right. So are there other people out there who are hearing this and what are kind of keeping their heads down? They're keeping their silent. They're going along with it. Uh, see, this is the problem in, for for Republicans who want Donald Trump's endorsement. You not only have to embrace the big lie, you have to keep embracing it always. It doesn't matter how long you've embraced it. You cannot deviate ever. And he's going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. But I think this is the question that the media ought to ask every single Republican that is in Trump world right now. Do you support or uh, or not? rescinding the election and reinstalling Donald Trump now to the presidency. Get them on the record to answer that and see what people say. Absolutely. Hammer. And you saw what his, so you saw what his primary opponent did, right? Mm -hmm. In in the race mm -hmm. in Alabama, the primary opponent puts out a statement uh, that is, is pure slavish MAGA and that, that Mo Brooks was weak and he's the, you know, all in, I mean, you know, so that's, that's where that guy is. I mean, he, he, I don't think he paused for a nanosecond over what Mo Brooks said. Not, not that Brooks has much credibility, as you say, pretty unreliable narrator. But still, you know, that's where many in the Republican Party are. Okay, so it's 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 so extraordinary. I the fact that again on my dance card, I did not have Mo Brooks breaking with Donald Trump about all of this. I just I. I didn't, I didn't have that. Okay. So on the, on this category of strange stories, as God is my witness, Mona, I am not making this up. Okay. Okay. This is not a spoof. This is not a troll. This is what's actually happening now. Vladimir Putin is giving a speech in Russia live on television, and he is using JK Rowling as an example of Western cynicism and cancel culture, which he says is currently being aimed at Russia. <sighs> and he's talking about cancel culture and J.K. Rowling, of course, who you know came on, who was, who was canceled for saying certain things about uh, the trans world, uh, transsexuality. Vladimir Putin sounds like he is, he's channeling a Daily Wire podcast. He is. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm just... <laughs> He is absolutely is. I mean, look, the, the, it's a two-way street, right? He, Putin gives the right-wing media people their talking points, and they get some from him, and uh, they have a nice little exchange going. Look, I think that we do have a problem with our cowardice about discussing certain issues in this country. The New York Times had a big editorial last yeah. week about we have a problem with free speech. People are afraid of being canceled. They're afraid of being harshly criticized and so forth. And so there are certain subjects, trans being the most sort of radioactive, where people are afraid to say, well, wait, I'm not sure that this, you know, these these puberty blockers and so and yeah, but this has nothing to do are, with what's going on with Russia and Vladimir so why, Putin hang on, right I'm going to okay. get there. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. Okay. So I think that we have that problem, right? Hmm. But there are people on the right who say that because we have a problem with certain amount of cowardice on discussing the trans issue, that that means we should endorse the Hitler of our time, <laughs> <laughs> Vladimir Putin. It's obvious they were driven to it, Charlie. They have no choice because J.K. Rowling got criticized. And therefore, you know, you've got to be for a guy who 
doesn't allow any free speech, who arrests people, poisons people, and is committing war crimes on a massive scale in Ukraine. So obviously that's what you have to do. All right. I, I want to separate this conversation from anything involving Vladimir Putin. It's just the, the sort of the cynicism of Vladimir Putin. But you had a fantastic piece in the Bulwark yesterday. Trans politics needs to slow down and wait for trans science. You said the left should soften its dogmatism. The right should abandon its cruelty. And we had talked about this on the secret podcast before this was published. And I said, you know, nice knowing you before you got canceled. But <laughs> you, I, I'm not seeing that you got a lot of blowback on this, which is, I think, kind of interesting that you that actually was... you struck a, a nuanced position on this issue and you have not been destroyed, which might be a tell in a, yeah. in, in, in a positive way. Yeah. So a couple things. I mean, first of all, yes, there were some overheated reactions, naturally, but I am striving, you know, with my podcast, Beg to Differ, and, and in my writing, I am striving to prove that there is still an audience out there for being reasonable and not going to the extremes. I mean, there are so many incentives. We talked about this so much in our culture to go for the clicks, to go for the low blow, to, to you know, just do fan service for your own side. And it is remunerative and there are tons of pressures, but... There is an audience out there, and I think the bulwark proves that, for reason and for saying, you know, there's a, the, both sides have something to say here. Let's not get hysterical about everything. And, uh, and so I tried, to, I tried to present it in as fair a way as I could and make some points that I think are getting neglected in the, in the current discussion. One of the things I pointed out is that other countries – have a different approach and have sort of pulled back from the always do the puberty blockers and and cross hormones, you know, immediately without question. They're saying, well, actually, you know, these young patients, I'm not talking about adults, mm -hmm. I'm talking children. about kids. Yeah. Children need children. to be carefully evaluated. They need to have their whole psychological profile, what's going on with them. And you do need to take into consideration that there are social influencers out there on TikTok, on the YouTube, and in, 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 in teen culture in general that are encouraging kids to think that their problems could be solved by, you know, this route of, of becoming trans. And by the way, I don't know, I, I, I promised yeah. to stop my filibuster after no, this one no, last no. point, but can I just, you know, I'm a woman, I went through adolescence, and honestly, puberty for girls is a lot less fun than it is for boys. I'm just going to say that. There are a lot of aspects about puberty that are confusing, I, I you know, differ. difficult, painful, you know, you start bleeding once a month, that's not so fun. And, you know, to be told, to, to be careful, I think, about telling girls that, you know, and a lot of them have lots of other sort of things that are going on in their lives. And, and you know, to tell them that they can, they can escape all that, it, you, when you say that to, a, to an 11, 12, 13-year-old girl who's not mature enough to understand the long haul, I can see how that, you know, with a borderline kid could be enticing. And so I worry about presenting it in, in terms that don't require careful psychological counseling. Well, the other question, of course, is this unfortunate heated debate about uh, transgender athletes. I, I, I saw yesterday a normally reasonable columnist for a major newspaper. I, I'll pick on them later, but not right now. <laughs> I was talking about, uh, you know, Le Leah Thomas and yeah. was saying that she has become an icon of hate for people on the right. And I thought that this is a, a dangerous road to go down because I don't think that concern about transgender athletes and what it's doing to women's sports, I don't think it's about hate. I think it's about fairness. And I think we can have a debate about fairness. What are women's sports for? Is there a legitimate distinction between men's and women's sports? Are there unfair advantages there? Are the women who are concerned about what's happening to uh, sports, are they all bigots? Is that the way it's going to be framed? Because I will tell you just from a strictly political point of view, uh, that a very strong majority of Americans, and again, I, I think we're at this moment where I think a majority of Americans are quite accepting of transgender individuals. A, a I agree. Polls would show that they are very accepting of transgender members of the military, but this same electorate, you have a very strong majority against transgender athletes, uh, you know, former men 
um, if I get canceled for that, um, competing <laughs> against women. And so this is one where I, I see the progressives, um, you know, sort of locking themselves into this sort of dogmatic position that any questions or criticism of any of these policies is a form of bigotry and hate when, in fact, I think that there are legitimate medical reasons, developmental reasons, uh, you know, competitive reasons in terms of sports that we ought to talk through and that do violate in some cases when we're talking about, uh, you know, Leah Thomas winning all of these championships uh, competing as a woman. There are legitimate questions about that. And I think it does offend an innate sense of fairness on the part of many Americans and and calling them bigots and and haters I don't think it's going to be particularly constructive or helpful. No, I, I agree. And and since we're talking about things that are unhelpful, we should also mention, as I did in that piece, that some of the things that the Republicans are doing are also, you know, Horrible. not helping. Horrible. So Greg Abbott of Texas signed an executive order that, where he said that, that anybody who is seeking out transgender medicine for their kid, he said amounts to child abuse. So he's going to sick the uh, Department of Child Services on them. I mean, that's cruel and crazy and, you know, not the right answer either. But yes, there is a tendency on the part of progressives to be very dogmatic about this and to say that if you question it in any way, A, you're engaging in hate speech and B, you are consigned, you're either, you're erasing that person's identity. No, I mean, there are people who have this condition and they need to be treated with compassion and they need, you know, uh, time to, to, to reconcile themselves to their new identity, whatever. Yeah, they need to be treated with compassion. And the other thing they always say is that if you say slow down and don't immediately give puberty blockers and, and cross-sex hormones and surgeries, which are going on, by the way, for mm-hmm. young people, for teenagers, and these things are irreversible, you're told that you're consigning them to suicide. And, yeah. you know, that's just it's not that's not helpful. There, there are legitimate concerns about suicide. But, you know, I was I was really struck this last week, you know, because the question is, is there a, a nuanced middle ground that you're staking out? And I thought the Republican governor of Utah, Spencer Cox, struck a very interesting note. Now, his legislature, they had been uh, there's a little bit of complexity here. He you, you may have heard about this. I'm talking to the audience. You, you, you may have heard that he vetoed a ban on transsexual athletes. He's a Republican governor in a very conservative state. He vetoes the ban. It's going to be overridden. And he had a very long letter explaining his position, which was they had been working out a compromise on how to deal with it. He recognizes that there are fairness questions. And they had been working on a compromise to find a way to deal with this, which is still a very small problem among high school students in Utah. And yet at the last minute, the hair on fire extremists came in with a complete ban. Mm -hmm. And it basically, you know, sideswiped everybody. Nobody saw this coming. They rammed this thing through. And that's what he vetoed. And so he was explaining how, look. There are legitimate concerns. We could deal with them in this way. And there are, you know, dealing with the complexity. You've chosen to do this in this blanket way that sort of emphasizes insensitivity and cruelty. I'm going to veto it. We'll try to fix it. But then in the letter, he does make an appeal to say, you know, let's not be cruel. And he ran through the number of, you know, students that are in sports in in Utah, the fact that there are only four transgender athletes. And then he talked about, you know, the the problem of transgender kids who do contemplate suicide. And he says, we want you to live. And it was really one of those, it seemed very countercultural to hear somebody talking in those compassionate terms, acknowledging the complexity of the problem, but also coming down in terms of real compassion. So people haven't checked it out. Uh, Spencer Cox in Utah, uh, I, I I think, uh, made a very, very interesting statement this last week. Charlie, you're you're leading me to do something that I have sworn I would never do again, which is Uh-oh. to fall in love with a politician. Uh, yeah, no, probably <laughs> not. Sounds, but, you know, he's no. so good. No, he's good on a lot of issues. And, uh, oh, well, anyway. Okay, well, well, here's the antidote for falling in love with politicians. Let's talk about uh, the jackassery. <laughs> um, in, 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 in Washington, I, I noticed that, uh, your beg to differ podcast yesterday was monsters and jackasses, right? It was, uh, yep. um, yep. great, great title. I assume the monsters were Vladimir Putin. Let's talk about the jackasses. This was a term that, uh, that Ben Sass used to describe certain unnamed members <laughs> of the judiciary <laughs> committee, including if you see the video of this, he's sitting right next to Ted Cruz. 
look, it must have I, been a coincidence. I don't think you have to compare the KBJ hearings to Brett Kavanaugh and do this while he's just as bad or it's worse. It's just another example, though, of senators behaving badly and just turning what should be serious hearings into this the series of, you know, performative, you know, displays of assholery. I mean, it was just yes. one after another. I mean, you could just tell they didn't care how they looked beating up on this highly qualified African-American woman. They weren't worried about that because Ted Cruz knows that he's appealing to a certain kind of Republican primary voter. So was Tom Cotton. So was Lindsey Graham. So was Josh Hawley. And it, so it was one performative act of jerkitude after another. It and it was, really it was just, was. it was, it was just depressing. Oh, you know? it was so depressing because, you know, Charlie, we are old enough to remember when <laughs> these hearings, which have always had some element of performance, let's face it, but at least most of the time it was questions of presidential authority. It was, you know, statutory interpretation. It was, you know, questions about, and of course, attempting to get at where somebody stood on abortion, but still, These questions, I mean, Lindsey Graham isn't even running for anything as far as I know. Most of them have presidential ambitions. He doesn't as far as I know. But anyway, he he was horrible. He was asking her how how often she went to church. Um, By the way, Ketanji Brown Jackson, I'm sure I would disagree with 80% of her rulings. Actually, I should take that back Mm because 80% of the rulings of the Supreme Court are pretty you know, uh, they're not ideological and they're not ideological. Right. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I suspect I would disagree with her on a lot, but the attempt by the execrable Josh Hawley to conflate, for example, child abusers with consumers of child porn. And I have no brief for for Uh, people who get child porn, but honestly, even Andrew McCarthy of national review went after the dishonesty and jerkitude to use your word of that attack. But she is a woman of tremendous accomplishments. I thought her presentation, she showed such poise. She was so winsome. I loved, you know, that she acknowledged that, you know, as a mom, she may not have always gotten the balance right. I mean, every working mother could identify with that. And she was so sincere. She was so patriotic. She was inspiring in her patriotism and in her praise for how far this country has come. These are these civil rights. I mean, I found her inspiring and great. And yeah, fine. She's to my left. But the president, by the way, is a Democrat. So what do you expect? No, they had to go after her in such a disrespectful way. Tom Cotton. Oh, God. I'm sorry. Am I? I'm on a No, 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 no. He was badgering. I mean, it was. I was was badgering her. I was watching that going. What are you doing here? Oh. I mean, you are just and and I, I understand people who are, who are still you want to relitigate Kavanaugh and say, oh come on, you can't complain about this because look what the Democrats did to Kavanaugh. Yeah. Okay. Well, that doesn't justify it because I have this vision in my mind now, which I don't think is fanciful. Let's see what you think of it. Is that obviously when she's confirmed and she goes and she meets her fellow justices, she's part of this lifetime club. And apparently they more or less get along with one another or they try to get along. And that the first conversation that they're all going to have will be sitting around going, man, aren't the senators a bunch of assholes? (laughs) Right. I mean, honestly, wasn't that terrible? Brett Kavanaugh is going to sit down over a beer with her and say, I'm sorry, that was awful. I know how you feel. Yeah, this is just maybe. it is yeah. it is just a miserable dehumanizing experience. And so you now have a Supreme Court that every time you hear Congress is going to think, yeah, remember those jerks? <laughs> <laughs> but Charlie, we have to pause for a second and focus on the extraordinary moment that Ben Sass provided. I mean, I've never seen anything quite like that, I have to say, because Ben Sass is a Republican in good standing, and he called out his own party, his own colleagues for jackassery. That was amazing. Should, yeah, I should have named names. But yes, no, it was, I mean, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm willing to take what I can get. Okay, so yeah. there is one, if you spend any time on conservative media and for my sins I do because I want to know mm-hmm. what they're with what they're thinking one thing has gone absolutely viral from this the one thing in it it's the if you go into Ben Shapiro land where you can always find the lowest common denominator cheap shot bad faith take it is right. that question when the dumbest member of that committee Marsha Blackburn 
and well, she is. I mean, the woman is dumber than a box of hair. But she she is asking Judge Jackson define a woman, and Jackson says, "Well, I'm not a biologist." And this has become this big thing across conservative media. See, liberals can't even define what a woman is. And it ties back to what we were discussing before about transgender. You know, they want to play the QR card about child abuse. They want to play the soft on crime. They want to play affirmative action uh, CRT card. But they also want to play the C. Liberals can't even define what a woman is. What was your reaction to that exchange? Because I had a completely different reaction than most of Twitter apparently has to it. Okay, well, I don't know that you and I are actually on the same page here. Okay, that's great. One of the things that I find difficult in this era is that every now and then people on the right will say something that I kind of agree with, but they do it in such an offensive and bad faith way that I just want to distance myself. But look, I think that it was a ridiculous question. It had nothing to do with any case that she's going to be dealing with. And it was a gotcha sort of thing. So it was a bad question. Nevertheless, I mean, I don't think it's so hard to just say, and, you know, an adult female, you know, I mean, and then like screw up your face and say, why are you asking me this? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I do think that the conservatives are on to something in that it's becoming required and politically correct that you not acknowledge that there are two sexes. And so that's, see, that was my right. take. Yeah, see, I, I did not have I did not have that take. I, I thought this was a point out, you know, after after all of these bullshit questions that she's sitting there and going in her mind. And, and she wouldn't speak like this because she's a much more refined person than I am. OK, so I'm <laughs> trying to translate it. You have Marsha Blackburn asking these series of profoundly stupid questions that have absolutely nothing to do with the law, nothing to do with jurisprudence. And mm-hmm. she's asking, you know, define woman. And, and it's along the category of, so Mona, can you define a dog? Define a dog. <laughs> you go, okay, I'm, I'm not a vet, right? I'm, I'm not, I'm not, a, I, I, I can't define a dog. I, you know, mm. and what KBJ was, was thinking was, Oh, for fuck's sake. What is no, she no asking question. me? And no. she's yeah. just like, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm a judge. I'm not a biologist. I am not going to play your word games. And, and I think that's what she was doing. And I, I think that the attempt to turn that into somehow that this is her unwillingness to acknowledge the number of genders, you know, I, I think reads way too much into it. I think she was incredibly patient, but I oh think there God, was a yes. bit of exasperation. Now, again, no, your interpretation true. could be right, but I just sense as a human being, there's just a level of exasperation that at some point when you're somebody's asking you some crazy question you don't know, you go, I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm not, not an expert in this. Now, of course, yeah, as you, you, uh, you, and, you, and, you and I are experts in epidemiology. We're experts in cruise <laughs> missiles now, and now we're experts in all of this stuff. But at some point you say, you know what? I, I just, I don't know. I, I don't have a medical degree yeah. in infectious disease. I am not a biologist. I, you know, what's, here, what, what's what, a woman? What what, I, okay. So you define it. What, no, so Mona Churn, here, here, Mona Churn, <clears throat> Judge Churn, yeah. define woman. <laughs> Adult female. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Define female. <laughs> you want a lifetime the, position on this podcast? <laughs> you, are you saying you cannot define the term woman. No. Okay. See so what I'm Charlie, saying here. It's like, Charlie, how do you do it? You're right. badgering the witness. Okay. So a, a, here. A man without I'm, a penis. What? I I'm mean, gonna... <laughs> what? I don't know. What are you supposed to say? Um, so here's what I will say. I'm going to get um, so much shit for say. this. So well, <laughs> remember when this all started and, and everybody agreed that one thing that the Republicans should avoid was seeming to badger the first woman black nominee to sit on the Supreme Court. Right. And they didn't take that advice. They did treat her badly. And so I'm Mr. wondering Mr. if they'll pay Ms. any Mr. price Ch- for it. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman point of one order. One second. No, I want, to, I want to quote our colleague, <laughs> Bill Crystal, okay. who had a good tweet about how when she was being badgered about CRT yeah. and racism of babies and other absurd things that she should have said that, no, she doesn't believe in teaching children that they're racist, but she was dismayed to discover that there were more of them in the Senate than she had realized. Yeah, that was that was a, that was a very good line. <laughs> good. Okay, yeah, can I do it now? Okay, you can do it now. Mr. Okay, Chairman, Mr. Chairman, yeah. point of order. 
Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, Judge Chern, I want to point out, has not answered my question how she would define <laughs> woman. Senator, <laughs> this is a matter that could come up in, in, in uh, cases before the court. And because of that, I cannot comment on anything right, okay, that might okay. be right, a okay. justiciable oh, okay, matter. Right. Okay. Yeah. Hey, uh, could you just get me uh, Tucker Carlson on the line here? <laughs> um, Judge Mona Charon refuses saying that it would be up to the courts to define what the definition of a woman is. You see, you know. <laughs> Check, check me out tonight. I'm going to be on Laura Ingram and I'm going to be on Shine Hannity. And and let me just scroll through my Twitter mentions on that. See, I this is the gotcha stuff. And I agree. And, and, it is gotcha uh, stuff. It's stupid. But yeah. Yeah. Could we, but, could we have one more um, jackass question here? OK. In the time that we have. That depends. Kevin McCarthy. <laughs> Look, I, he's he's gone all in against Liz Cheney. And I know that people know this, but Hunchbull had this copy of this invitation for a fundraiser for Harriet Hageman or Hageman. Do you know how to pronounce yep. that? Uh, who's running against Liz Cheney. And he is the main host of the fundraiser against a challenger to an incumbent member of his own party, which is, shall we say, a little bit unusual. And you have this long list of all of these congressmen. Almost every Republican congressman who has signed up to do this and Punchbowl says Kevin McCarthy's animosity toward Cheney truly knows no bounds, you know, that he's appearing at this fundraiser and quietly working other Republicans to line up with with Hageman shows the depths of his distaste for Cheney. And so you look at this list, you got Rand Paul, you know, former Senator Dean Heller, uh, Ryan Zinke, Jim Jordan, Elise Stefanik, <sighs> Jason Smith. I mean, this is go on and on and on. I like the quote from Cheney's spokesman who points out that here's a leader who has taken no moves to oust or punish the other fringe members like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Paul Gosar. And uh, Jeremy Adler says, a leader with honor would be rejecting, not protecting the pro-Putin, anti-Semitic, white nationalist members of the party instead of fighting against Liz Cheney for telling the truth. But yeah, isn't that something? So as we talked about on the secret podcast, I actually attended a fundraiser for Liz Cheney, mm -hmm. gave her money. And uh, you know how many members of Congress were at that fundraiser? I'm guessing none. One. Oh, uh, really? That is a senator, Mitt Romney. So oh, good for him. Leadership matters. You know, we roll our eyes. We say, there they go again. But every single step down that staircase to ruin could be different. It could be different. If, if, if McCarthy had an ounce of integrity, if he said, you know, I, I realize that the, the conference didn't want Cheney to be in leadership anymore, but I'm not going to host a fundraiser right. uh, for her opponent. That I'm not going to do. That's just not right. There would not be a hundred members who would be there. His leadership, his lack of character and integrity matters even now, even when things have gone so far, because they're, they keep going down that staircase further and further and further. And so the Republican Party is completely corrupt. I'm sorry. Well, it's interesting, the definition of party loyalty now, because uh, you might you might have seen that your former colleague, uh, Henry Olson, I'm not trying to get you into a fight. Uh, your former colleague, Henry Olson, had a column in the Washington Post where he ripped Mitt Romney for not supporting his fellow Senator Mike Lee from Utah and said that Mitt Romney was betraying his party. <laughs> I haven't noticed any columns from Mr. Olson about Kevin McCarthy betraying his party by right. actually raising money against a member of his own party. So party loyalty only goes one way. So yes, Mitt Romney, you betrayed the party by not supporting Mike Lee, but Kevin McCarthy, well, that's just his job. He's just doing his job right. by trying to, you know, purge the one honorable, patriotic, pro-constitution, anti-coup member of his caucus. By the way, Charlie, a million years it was the rule that leaders of their party did not endorse in primaries ever. Right. I mean, they would always say, oh, right. no, no, you know, I'm not going to get involved in that. Not not going to endorse in a primary. And uh, so, yeah, here we are. Uh, yeah, here we are. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the the list of, uh, of of congressmen that have signed up to be in this fundraiser. And there's my congressman from Wisconsin. Oh, of course. Well, things, well, but but of course, <laughs> Mona, thank you so much for coming on the uh, our weekend podcast. Appreciate it very, very much. Uh, people should you, check Charlie. out our 
our secret podcast because we really, I mean, we are off the leash on the secret podcast, right? We let our hair down. I don't have much, but. <laughs> we are not, <laughs> compared to me, um, <laughs> you know, compared to this podcast where, of course, we are very buttoned up. And, exactly. Know, very, very restrained. <laughs> so, so thanks a lot. Have a I, nice I'm, weekend, Charlie. I, I appreciate it. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast. And we'll be back tomorrow. Do this all over again.